Amen. Once again, it's great to be here. Give honor to our bishop, ministry team, my lovely wife who now has glasses. Amen. She looks more smarter. All those years of laughing at me and the kids has caught up with her. Now she is just as blind and probably worse than a lot of us. Amen. <laughs> I always told her, I said, I think it's a, it's a trick of the optometrist. Because she was seeing great about a year ago. Now she's all of a sudden blind. I don't know how it happened. And she falls into it. No, I can't see. You can see. So I don't know. But they just keep making money off of us. <laughs> it's a big business. 2 Samuel 23, 11 and 12. And after him was Shammah, the son of Aji, the Herite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. You all may be seated. I'm so glad that the Lord loves us enough to make up the difference. Amen. When we think that we got it, and when we get there, it's like, oh, we don't got it. Amen. But we're there. God will make up the difference and win. Put the, the slide, first slide, Eli, or Donovan. So I'm going to talk about defending your field of lentils. Defending your field of lentils. Now, I won't be long because... <coughs> There's steak in the back, and I'm talking about peas. So it just, I can't compete with that. <laughs> um, but God is so good. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful day. I thank you for what you're going to do in this place tonight, Lord God. Lord, move upon my mind, my heart, upon your people, Lord God, from your mind, through my mouth to their ears, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's give God another hand clap of praise. Now, you know me, I'm more of a, I'm a visual type of guy. I got to see what I'm talking about. And so I like to bring out videos and pictures to kind of show, uh, to give you an idea of what's going on during the time of the event, especially in the Old Testament. So I try to put pictures up to kind of help you follow along, especially with this. Verse 11 has a few, um, had a few things I needed to understand, so I kind of did some study on it to kind of help bring out the scripture. So it says in verse 11, and, that and after him was Shammah, the son of Ag the Herite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. Could you put up this, the uh, second um, slide? So I said, a troop. And I was in the, in the Marine Corps. Hoorah. <sighs> I know there's one. I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I'm not talking about you Navy guys, Army, Air Force. We don't want to hear none of that. I said, hoorah. Now, hoorah. All right. So I said, what, what? A troop. What does it mean in troop? So look up company, two to four platoon. So 100 to 200 people are in a troop, right? Uh, Gideon and Judges, Gideon um, has 300 men in his company, which he breaks out into three groups of troops of 100. So it's kind of safe to say that, again, the troop we can attribute to about 100, about 100 people, 100 men. And in that same verse, a piece of ground full of lentils. So do you guys know what a lentil is? You know what lentils are? Mm -hmm. Everybody know. Um, a lentil, oh, first, I'm sorry. First, in that verse, it's talking about a, a plot of ground, a piece of ground. Put it up the second slide, Eli. So I started thinking about when they're plowing their ground, plowing their ground to get it ready for um, 
the fields and stuff, like how big is a plot of land? How big would it be for them to make these, uh, to plant these lentils? So I got some statistics here. Maybe a full plot of land is about 60 feet by 120 feet, something like that, or 60 by 60, 60 by 100. It's a good piece of property. This, the next slide, Eli, or Donovan. So this slide is about, this could be a plot of land where Shema stood in the middle of this, these two pieces here. That could be a, that's a nice size plot of land. I would not want to fight in <laughs> nothing like that. Uh, put up the next slide. So this picture is actually a picture of some property in Cambodia. It's not our property. It's just a piece of property in Cambodia. And so this plot of land is 15 meters by 20 meters, which is about uh, 50 by 100. So that's a nice size. That's a good, even, square plot of land that you can take your stand and fight, 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 all right? Pretty nice, um, and it could have been a little circle feel. Uh, put up the next slide. Uh, this is a special plot of land here. You see all the, the green, the trees and stuff, and all the brown areas are the fields. So this is actually a picture of my house, my property right here. This is where I grew up. This is my plot of land in Georgia. The greatest piece of land ever. <laughs> and you can see all the, the fields and stuff in the brown. So we played my, if you see up top or in the middle, it's a little land with houses. That's my little area. Down there is my cousin's uh, land. And so we used to play in those fields. Run, uh, we play football, baseball, um, tackle the man with everything. We played pool in the dirt. It was, rode our bikes all over the place. To me, living in the country was the greatest place a young boy, a young man could ever be. Some girls too, some of y'all, some Tom, Tom boys around here. But I enjoyed living there. And to tie this in, we grew peas, um, peanuts, um, watermelons, different type of stuff in these fields. So I just wanted to show you my, my plot of land. I don't, don't really have nothing to do with this, but I just wanted to show you <laughs> where I'm, my land, where I love. And we own about 100 acres, which is a lot. It's probably bigger than that. But we had, and so just, it brought back so many good memories. I said, you know what, let me see if I can pull it up. And boom, there it was. <laughs> my dad is looking, so he's probably going to text me, why? <laughs> uh, next slide. So I said, okay, a ground full of lentils. So in my mind, this is probably, in that area, probably rough, beat up dirt, uh, rocks. I'm sure it took some time to plow this field, especially did it by hand. It may not have been this straight because it did it by hand, but I think maybe this is what uh, it could possibly be. And now, the next slide is going to show you what a lentil looks like. That's a lentil. So how many of you guys knew that it looked like that? Sure you did. Sure, sure you did. <laughs> sure. Uh, so what are lentils? Lentils sometimes referred to as pulses or a type of plant called legume. Beans, chickpeas, fresh peas, sugar snap peas, snow peas are also legumes known for their high levels of protein compared to beans. Lentils bring a, a lot to the plate. While some legumes, like soybeans, are high in fat, lentils are very low in fat. They are great beans. I eat lentils. Now, I do buy it in a can, which is probably bad, <laughs> but I eat, I eat it for dinner. It's very good, and it's very fulfilling. My kids won't eat it. <laughs> now, with... Lentils are good to grow, it's good for the soil because they fix nitrogen in the soil. What that means is, along with, with the bacteria that live in the soil, they only grow without taking nitrogen from the soil, but it actually 
brings extra nitrogen to the soil and to the soil in the fields. So it's a win-win for the farmers and for the environment. A field planted with legumes for a year or two um, will need less fertilizer the next time a different crop is grown. So it's a growing uh, legumes or lentils, it makes the earth, the soil way much better, more pure, it's better. So that way next year when they grow something different like corn, they don't need much fertilizer. Definitely a win-win. So the historical and biblical significance of lentils is extensive. Lentils were a very important food in ancient times. So I said, why do they call it, you ever heard it, heard it called a pea patch, right? They always refer to it as a pea patch. Now I did some looking. The only place I found where it says pea patch is in the Good News Translation. Have you ever heard of the Good News Translation? But y'all are on it today. That's the first time I saw it. <laughs> the Good News Translation calls it a pea, calls it a pea patch. So I, I was looking, I like, think, where in the world have I seen lentils? So the Lord brought me back to Genesis 25 with a group of boys, Esau and Jacob. Esau was a hunter, a man of the field, a hairy guy. He loved venison. He loved meat. So one day he was coming in from hunting his brother Jacob. Jacob was a man of the field. He grew vegetables, and he was, a, he was more of a, an administrator in my mind. He sat in the home. He learned. He was a man of, of books and stuff. That's how I look at Jacob. And so Esau came in from hungry from, from hunting. He said, give me some of your lentils. Verse 25 and 30. Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore to him, and he, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went this way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau gave up land, uh, cows, which is goats, which is money, all for a bowl of soup. Put up the next picture. This is what, the next picture. Hope I sent that to you. Is that the only picture? Oh, I missed it. So there's a bowl, there's a bowl of pottage, which is beans. It's a, it's a soup. He gave up, he gave up, he gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. So that tells you, them lentils are great. <laughs> they are fulfilling. Yeah. All you meat lovers out there, try some lentils. <laughs> Again, we read in Daniel chapter 1, when Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were taken from the homeland, not as with the Chaldeans. The king said, I want you to eat the king's meat. Now, they took, the Chaldeans only took the best of the best kids from the land they took them from. So they were already smart. So he said, I want to feed you guys the king's meat. All the good fattening stuff. All the steak and make everybody eat today. Uh, pork, all the high and fat stuff. But Daniel said, no, let us eat what we normally eat, and I promise you we'll be better than everybody else. So verse 12 said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pots to eat and water to drink. 
And at, at the end of the ten days, their continents appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Poats is another word for lentils. So they ate beans and water for ten days, and they were stronger, faster, smarter than the ones who eat the king's meat. So I say, uh, Sister Wilson, we should make a bowl of lentils back there, and it will help a lot of people. See how quiet they got? See how quiet they got? Nobody want the lentils. <laughs> no more steak, lentils. Where's Miguel? Miguel here? <laughs> Thank you, Sister Terry. So that's a little background on verse 11. You saw what lentils looked like. I'll give you a plot of land, how big it could have been. So Shammah was a man who was just like everybody else. He was nothing special. Actually, the name Shema means waste, to be desolate or appalled. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> I need my kid desolate. <laughs> so we get back into the mighty men. So the verse starts out verse in um, 2 Samuel 23, 8. It says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tekemite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adino and the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against the 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahite, one of three mighty men with David. They defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were going away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And then began to, to Shammah. These were the greatest of the greatest of David's men. And there were over 30 men that David had. But these men were particularly outstanding. Because when you go into verse uh, 14, I'm sorry, verse, verse 14, and David was then in, in an hold, and the garrison of the Philistine was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these mighty men. So a garrison that were back in Bethlehem was about two to 300 people. So they broke through the, Philist the garrison, got a cup of water, and brought it back. These were the mightiest of the mightiest men. But what made them special? These mighty men came to David at a time when he was caught up in a cave, running from King Saul, hiding. He'd been kicked out. He'd been abandoned. Verse 22 says, David therefore departed this and escaped to the cave of Bedullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. 400 men who were in debt, they were not happy. 400 men. What would make these men follow David? These men were down and out. They were lost. They were desolate and looking for hope. These are also the type of men who, who wouldn't trust anyone. So why follow David? These men were not mighty when they first got to David. There were men who were hurting and needed 
a leader. David was a warrior. He killed Goliath. David was in charge of the king's army. He was a leader. David was kicked out of the kingdom that made him a wanted man like them. David's character was tarnished by the king, which a man could understand. David looked exactly like them. Pushed away, turned aside. That's what draws people to us. When they can say, they can look at you and say, you know what? You've been where I've been. But only they can know this if you tell your testimony. So why not follow a man who can understand? David went from a hero to a zero, and those men can relate to that type of a man. They decided to take a stand with David and fight alongside of him, even though the king declared him a fugitive. This doesn't make David or the men bad, but misunderstood and somewhat of misfits. David knew all about their accomplishments, what they've done, what they're going to do. He did the same thing. He stood when no one else would stand in front of a giant, and he won. David stood when this Philistine started talking about his God. Are we standing on the word of God when somebody is talking crazy about our God, about what we believe in? Are we standing on that word? David went and defended Israel. There was a huge army behind him. Israel was way behind him. And that's where they stayed. There will be many times when you have to stand on what you know and what you believe in. Pastor won't be there. The elders won't be there. The youth staff won't be there. But you are going to be there. And what are you going to do? Are you willing to die for this? The way this world is going, you just may have to. I know the rapture's coming. We don't, but you don't know when it's your time to go. Every day be ready. When you stand and defend the Lord, we give you a great victory. There was nothing special about Shema except that he got tired of running. When you look throughout history, you will see that people who got tired of running and chose to stand up and fight for what was right went down in history, went down in history, went down in history. Sometimes they had to die for what they defended. It's not about the right now wins, but it's about the ultimate victory. In order to be great, you got to do something great. Judges chapter 4, we talk about Deborah and Barak. Barak was going against King Sisera, and Barak would not fight without Deborah by, her, by his side. She said, I'll come with you, but if I do, you are not going to get the recognition for this battle. That's fine. So they fought. Everyone was killed. King Sisera ran, but he ran to the wrong house. In verse 17, how bit Sisera ran, Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Hebron the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. At this point, Jael made up in her mind that she was going to take a stand against this evil king. And he said unto her, unto her Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. She opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. The king asked for water. You know, water sometimes energizes you. Sometimes it'll, it'll, you feel unloaded, it'll, it'll, it'll pick you up. But she gave him milk to drink. I remember when I was little, a vivid memory. My mom, she was to heat up some milk and give it to us to drink and help you to fall asleep. It's, just, it's heavy, just, she probably put something in it. But, um, they helped you fall asleep. So milk is a, it's a thick substance. It's just something about milk. Now, it's great 
unless you're lactose intolerant like me. <laughs> if I drink milk, I will not be going to sleep. <laughs> so, so I don't mess with milk. But she was smart enough to give him milk instead of water. Again, he said unto her, stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when, the, when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, is there any man here that thou shalt say no? Then Jael helped his wife, took a nail of the tent, and took a hammer in her hand, and went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep, weary, so he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. This woman took a stand and said, Not today. I'm going to risk my life to stop this man who is destroying other lives. She defended her home and the homes of many other people. And when she did, God honored her with a victory. Victory is promised to those who stand, who stand for the Lord. And then verse 24 said, Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Hebner, the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. When you do, when ordinary people do ordinary things, when ordinary people do great things, great will your name be. You're not seeking recognition for your name, but God promotes and gives you a great name because you wasn't fearful. We're too fearful of a people. We have too much inside of us to be running and hiding from the enemy. We got too much going on within ourselves. The word of God is powerful. I said the word of God is powerful. Sharper than, you see all the time when, when accidents happen, somebody says, in Jesus' name, the car writes itself or the animal stops the attack. There's power in the name of Jesus. We know too much, but when we don't take a stand on what we believe in, we don't plant ourselves in the middle of our mental field and fight, God cannot, he cannot do nothing with that. Let's look at, the, let's look at more of this, this story. So they're in the field, uh, verse 12. Um, they're going about, they're getting the field ready. And all of a sudden, the Philistine soldiers came, and they attacked. The Bible says that the Philistines, uh, they came during the harvest time. So during the harvest time, nobody's getting ready to fight. They're have they getting, they about to eat. They're getting their, their labor, their work. They're getting put in baskets. They're getting ready to have a party, have a big feast. And so when they came, it took them off guard. And the Bible says that they ran. They ran. Are we not watchful? Are we not watchful? We may be having a good time. We may be winning souls, but you got to be watchful. Because the enemy, he attacks when you, don't, when you least suspect it. The, the Philistines were attacking the Israelites at, a, at harvest time in an effort to take away their joy. Because there is joy when you're getting ready to eat. Woohoo, you get happy. When you're getting your harvest in for all your work, you get happy. There's joy in the work. They attacked the harvest because to attack the harvest would mean an opportunity to destroy the Israelites' food supply. Without proper food supply, they knew that the Israelites would become weak, and the weaker they were, the easier it would be for them to gain victory. Fear struck their hearts. Because they, they, were, they were just peasants. They had shovels and the little spades and the, the little hoes and the little, little tools that they used. So they said, this ain't worth it. They dropped it and they ran. It would have been a great victory. But for one man. For one man. He was one of David's mighty men. Now, I can't say 
that he was a mighty man at that time? I don't think he was. I just think that Shammah got tired of the Philistines attacking and taking what God has said is yours. This land is yours. This field is yours. This field was there to help feed the soldiers that were coming by, to give them strength, nourishment, the families. And one man got tired of people coming and taking what God said was theirs. So he took a stand in the middle of the field. Are we taking a stand? Are we standing? What are you standing on? What are you believing on? Shama understood something about the tactics of warfare. Maybe this field was nothing but an ordinary lentil patch, but this attack was not random. It was strategic. The Philistines had chosen this, this lentil field because they thought no one would bother to defend it, such a worthless field, and they could take it without a battle. But on this piece of land, the Philistines would establish a stronghold, possibly a base because they got food to eat, which they can launch future attacks on the nation of Israel. When the enemy comes to assault your life, he is not going to start with the thing you are most diligent over. He's going to attack your, your, your lentil patch, your pea patch. That thing he figures you will not bother to defend, where he thinks you will compromise, and in that compromise, he will establish a stronghold to take over your life. And I'm sure you've seen it before. The, it's the little things. A couple has just got married. They are so in love, can't spend enough time together. But a few year, few years later, a few years later, a radical transformation has taken place. They hate each other. They want a divorce. You say, how did this happen? It happened but one pea patch at a time, one lentil at a time. Solomon wrote, the little foxes that spoil the vines, the little things that get you. A little bit of dishonesty here, disrespect, hurtful words, transgression, unforgiveness, the root of bitterness that sin, and, that, and long before the enemy has successfully established a stronghold in that couple's marriage. From that compromise zone, he would continue to assault their marriage to his tore up the ground that they walk on. You must have integrity, being vigilant over them as over, over, the, over the small things, over the big things. Shalom was a, an experienced warrior. He knew that if he compromised his little, little lentil patch, soon the enemy would be kicking down his front door. He was fiercely determined not to give up one inch to the Philistines. I'm not giving you nothing. If we could defend even the smallest insignificant patch in our lives, the enemy would not be able to gain a foothold rather than seeing how close we can get to the cliff of sin without falling over. We should seek to avoid even the appearance of evil. Rather than asking how much compromise is too much, how much compromise is too much. We should be constantly aiming to raise our personal standards to be more like Jesus every day. Murder was condemned under the law, but Jesus said hatred is murder. Adultery was condemned under the law, but Jesus said lust is adultery. Jesus understood that murder grows from the seed of hatred and adultery grows from the seed of lust. Once the seed has planted, the tree, while not fully mature, has been born, but it is, it is but a matter of time before it takes root and takes hold and begins to destroy you from inside out. Having integrity means being brutal with sin. Shema was brutal with the Philistines. He didn't play. Put that picture up again, uh, Donovan, the, the first one, the title slide. In my mind, this is him. All these men in the back, he just got his little, his little sword, his little, and just going to town. But he's defending what's his. He's defending what God said, this is yours. You take a stand, and I will be with you. He did not meet the Philistine with a, with a white flag, but with a sharpened ox gold. He hadn't come to talk, but he came to fight. 
We got to be ready to fight. If we are to be men and women of integrity, it will not happen by accident. Integrity requires ferocity and resolve. We see this demonstrated in Job, and it said, Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast. I will not let it go. My heart should not reproach me as long as I live. Are we taking a stand in our hearts, in our life? Someone stood in that field all by himself. Sometimes we got to stand by ourselves. Your family going to leave you. Your friends going to leave you. But he wasn't alone. God was in the field with him. God gave him the battle. God gave him the victory. We have to persevere. Don't stop. We're always looking for shortcut, shortcuts, tips, tricks. But I'm afraid there is nothing. There is nothing, no way around this principle. You could be extraordinary, you be gifted, talented, anointed, and blessed. But without pers- persistence, you will have little impact because the great victories are always on the other side of great battles. If you start and stop, you will lose. He knew what it meant to be persistent, to stand firm. We're at a disadvantage sometimes. We are the lone voice, right or wrong. In the boardroom, in, in the parents' meetings, staff meetings, network meetings, you have a great idea, a great vision, a desire uh, for a powerful thought or work to do, and it seems like everybody is against you. We have been trained to be peacemakers, Jesus says, Jesus extols peace, but there's a time when we must speak out. Our passion is like fire in our bones. If you are numbered, think about scaling back or break your vision to smaller, digestible pieces. But don't give up. We always must remember our enemies, real or imagined, are not human. Parents, pastors, or deacons are not our enemies. This church staff is not your enemy. We are here for you. Amen. We are one body. We're working together as one. But the world would try to divide this. Oh, you go to that church. You're you paying that much money. You're doing this. That is the enemy. And so many of us fall into that trap. Oh, you know what? That's right. I can, if I had more money, I can buy that new car. I want to, or I can buy that new boat. But I give such and such amount of money to the church. That's a trick of the enemy. Some of the most wealthiest people, Walmart, the Waltons, they pay tithes. Mic drop. It's the principle. It's the principle. God's going to honor his principle of paying tithes and offerings. Don't be deceived from the world. They put on a show. They make you think, oh, we're doing great. But their lives are horrible. The lives are wrecked. Do not measure yourself against other people. There are days we fight, win, and take the credit. In reality, it was the Lord who did it. If we win the victory, don't give, don't say I did nothing. God has done this thing this day. We get our new job promotions. God has done this thing this day. We won an award for Teacher of the Year. Are you Teacher of the Years inside this place? God has done this thing this day. You're only doing what you're called to do is show up, do your work, go beyond, above and beyond what you do. God give you recognition. God knows when it's time for you to get what you need to get. You're like, oh, man, I missed it. I didn't get it this time. Oh, no, it wasn't time. Persistence. Because one accomplishment is going to lead to another one. It's going to build on each other. If it's too soon, you're going to burn out and phase out. There are a lot of people who can tell you what's wrong and what everybody else should be doing. 
But wouldn't it all work, to work out better if everybody would defend their own pea patch? If everyone be faithful to his own assigned tasks, take care of his own friends, family, and sphere influence, if this happened, it wouldn't be long until the world was known for the kingdom of God. If everybody focused on their pea patch, this world would be great. The church would be full. Zechariah 4.10 asks the question, does anyone dare despise this day of small beginnings? I believe that we all have a job to do and we must do it. 1 Samuel 10 and 7 says, When therefore these signs shall happen to thee, do whatsoever thy hand shall find, for the Lord is with thee. Do whatsoever thy hand shall find, for the Lord is with thee. You want to start a new job? Do it. The Lord is with you. If not, he will change your direction. But don't quit. I'm big on gifts. That's my thing. Do what you love to do. Don't just eat potato chips and stuff. That, I mean, work-wise. Work. Work, 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 work. But when you do what you love to do, it's not work. You do it because you love to do it. You might say, what can I do? I have no special talents. But you can bring somebody to church. You can live a Christian life before them. You can live right, speak right, believe that this is a day the Lord has made. Shammah stood faithful over that which he was given. He fought a small battle and was rewarded with a big win. It's easy to get discouraged when things aren't turning out like they should. But it's not for us to question. It is our job only to tend out, to tend to our own pea patch and lead the rest to God. Maybe someday we can hear those words, Matthew 25, 21. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Do not give up. Any musicians come? When you have started living for the Lord, you have made some gains against the sinful life of your past. Don't think that sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to let you alone. They will troop up together to get you back in bondage to your old ways. And they will do whatever it takes to trip you up. You will find yourself facing temptation, stressed out, angry over something, or someone discouraged, tired, thinking that God doesn't care, struggling to come up with the money to pay your bills, whatever else may come up. That's a big troop of enemies that are going to come at you. But don't go back into that word of sin. Your ground full of lentils is important. Each one of those lentils or those, those patches should represent something or someone in your life that you are willing to fight for. Is it your marriage? Is it your family? Kids? When a church is Christ-centered and focused on the kingdom, it is a church that kicks the devil right in the teeth. When you have a church that is working for the Lord, you have a church that has, that has the devil's attention, and we have the devil's attention here in Nack. And when this happens, there's a battle headed your way. Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, was apprehended and persecuted because of his faith in Christ. Once captured, he asked for an hour in prayer, and his request was granted. Polycarp prayed so intently that his guards repented that they had been instrumental in taking him. He was carried before the proconsul and condemned to be burnt at the stake. The proconsul then urged him, saying, Swear, now we will release thee. He says, quit. Just say, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus. He's not. Just say, just do that. And I'll let you go. Polycarp answered, 86 years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king, who hath saved me? He was tied to the stake, and the fire was kindled. The flames encircled his body like an ark without touching him. The executioner, on seeing this, was ordered to pierce him with a sword. When he did, a great quantity of blood 
flowed out and extinguished the fire. Yes, Polycarp eventually died for his faith, but he left a lasting impression on those who were present at his execution. He had a choice, compromise or be courageous. He was courageous in the face of death. He took a stand in his pea patch. There will come a time when you find yourself at a crossroad, the crossroad of courage and compromise. Which road will you take? The Christian life is not a playground. This is not a playground. This is not, this is a battleground. If you're thinking anything else differently, then you're wrong. You're going to be chewed up and spit out. We are not playing because the enemy is not playing. He is coming for your soul. If you're not wise, you're not praying, you're not reading your word, he's going to trick you. Don't make it easy. Put the word in your heart. Talk about, you know what? If you begin to talk more about Jesus, it gets easier. The more you talk about him, the more he becomes alive with inside of you. Have, start having conversations. I guarantee it'd be the best conversation that you ever had. Find somebody at work to talk about Jesus about. You will enjoy those conversations. And you will begin to feel yourself talking more and more and more about our Savior. Consider what James said, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God gave Shammah the ability to stand, fight, and defeat the Philistines. Shammah may have held their sword, but it was God who won the the battle. This faithful man of God faced incredible odds, incredible odds, at least 100 men or more. And God gave him the victory. When we face spiritual battles, we must remember that we cannot apart from the Lord Jesus. Please stand. Because God had one man who was willing to stand, many people were saved from starvation. This message applies to each and every child of God as an individual. Everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a little purpose. A lentil patch that they can stand in and stand on. We are all in a battle in a battle against the enemy. Our ever saving the devil does not mind us having church. It doesn't mind us fellowshipping, singing, preaching. But this church is being used by God to accomplish great things for the kingdom. Christ is being preached. People are being saved. Lives are being changed. Christians are being discipled. We cannot forget where God brought us from. Where we was headed. What we were doing. And God put, he intervened right on time. No one said you would have got a second chance. I thank God when my friend came to me and invited me out to church. I thank God that I went. Now, I said this before, but I tried to go to a different church, and I couldn't go because I, I was his ride. I had to take him. He was a drummer, so I had to take him. I took him to the church, and when I took him, I just stayed. Now, the church was actually around the corner, <laughs> but I stayed because he was my friend, and I kept staying. Then I met the people, and it was over at that point. I met the youth group. The youth group is super important to a church. I can tell you, I would not be here if it wasn't for a youth group. I would not be standing here today. But they brought me in. They loved on me. Even with my crazy ideas, they were patient with me. I fought. And I fought, and I fought, 
But when they opened the word, when they opened the scriptures, I had nothing to stand on. I saw, I read, and I believed. And that was it. They stood on their, their lentils, their pea pads. They took a stand. What could I do but join them? I had to join them. The word of God trumps any and everybody else. It's harvest time. And the enemy would not like nothing more than to surround this harvest field and turn it into a battlefield. He wants to trample down the crops, scare off the people, and defeat those that remain. Will you be Shema? Will you stand and fight for the things of God? The altars are open. The victory is the Lord's, and he will win the battle. With or without you, but hopefully you decide that you won't be on the Lord's side. Take a stand inside your pea patch. Take a stand. Be willing to fight, defend what God has given you. Because as you stand there as a man and woman of God, he says, it's yours. So Abraham, wherever you look, it's yours. Wherever you stand, it's yours. I've given it to you. Let's claim it. Let's pray. Let's fast. Let's see God. But let's stand and let's defend. problems that we have in our lives are due to the fact that we ran away. Many of our hardships and heartaches are because we ran. Our problems look too big for us to handle. If it's too big for us 
that is just right for God. Shammah stood in the middle of it and was victorious. He stood in the middle of the field by himself. We have to learn to stand in the middle sometimes by yourself. We may be outnumbered in the moment by looking at it, but with God, we are the majority. It's just take God and you, and you are the majority of a hundred, thousand, two thousand, ten thousands. Understand the importance of your position right in the middle of your field. Not on the edge, not in the back, but right in the middle. That's where you take your stand. Don't get too close to the edge. That's where you get in trouble. But stand firm on the word of God and defend it with your whole heart. If you stand and defend, God will give you the victory. You may be in a storm right now, but I promise you God is bringing you out. When the disciples were on that boat, he didn't come at the beginning, but he came when they were right in the middle of that, of that body of water. And a storm came. They said, oh, we're going to be lost. And that's when, when we are weak, God is strong, and that's when he will show up. I thank God that Shama stood and fought that battle by himself. But I'm even more grateful that we are one body in Jesus Christ. And we ain't got to fight by ourselves. Amen. There are many brothers and sisters here who are going to stand shoulder to shoulder with each other. So find a brother and sister. Let's begin to pray. We can stand on our pea patches together and fight this battle together. There's wisdom in this sanctuary. There's joy in this sanctuary. There's togetherness in this sanctuary. We are here to fight this battle together. Amen. As they sing, let's pray. Let's get encouraged because God is getting ready to give us victory. Weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight. We're praising the weapons. The weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight. We're praising for the victory. The weapons, the weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight. Praise the Lord. I can't stop, can't stop. Praise in His name, I just can't stop. Praise in His name, I just can't stop. Praise in His name, Jesus. Oh, I can't stop, can't stop. Praise in His name, I just can't stop. Praise in His name, I just can't stop. Praise in His name, Jesus. Whoa, I can't stop, can't stop. Praise in His name, I just can't stop. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This message is for each and everybody that's in this place. Baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Man, woman, and child. Know your, your field, what you stand in. Know why you're standing in that field. 
begin to love your field. When you begin to work something, you begin to love it. Because you're putting time into it. You're putting your blood, sweat, and tears into this field. And when you put that much time into something, you're going to defend it with everything that you got. You put time into your friends at work, just, just talking to them, being nice to them, showing them how a Christian should be. You're more inclined to say, you know what? I am not going to give up this field to the enemy. I'm going to take a stand today and continue to fight. They might talk crazy to me. I'm going to continue to pray for them. They may lie on me. I'm going to continue to pray for them. But that's your field. God says you have victory wherever you stand. And your proximity, that's yours. You got to claim it. Believe it. Take a stand. Defend it. And God will give you victory. There's nothing greater than being a child of God. We've been born again, and we have victory. We just got to walk in it, believe it, and may even have to die for this. But if you believe in heaven, you got to believe in hell. Only two places you're going to go. So if you say, I believe in this, then you want to go to heaven. So that means you got to do what this word says to do. Reach out to the lost. Family, friends, neighbors, children. Show love. Tell your testimony. Let God do something great in your life. The ordinary, the ordinary person will become a great person in the kingdom of God. You hear stories of people who continually win souls, but you never hear their name. But in heaven, they are rejoicing constantly. It's not about what you see right here, but it's what is going on up out there. Praise God. Let's get our eyes on things that are holy, that are great. It's been a wonderful day in the house of the Lord. God has done some great stuff. Pastor always brings some meat for us. Amen. I brought some lentils, so we got a balanced out meal today. Now let's go get unbalanced with some more steak and ice cream. Please go back and support the children's ministry. Please remember March 10th is our sacrifice Sunday. Uh, this Saturday is our men's breakfast. Let's come out. Let's enjoy each other, love each other, check on each other. Let's help fight these battles. In the name of Jesus, you are dismissed. Amen. <laughs>